Well, everybody wants to have that perfect family, right? Especially in the age of social media. It's like, look how happy we are. Look how great we all get along. And truthfully, a lot of us go through absolute hell. You're listening to the MILF Podcast. This is the show where we talk about motherhood and sexuality with amazing women with fascinating stories to share on the joys of being a MILF. Now here's your host, the milfiest MILF I know, Jennifer Tracy. Hey guys, welcome back to the show. Thanks for listening. This is MILF Podcast, the show where we talk about motherhood, entrepreneurship, sexuality, and everything in between. I'm Jennifer Tracy, your host, and so excited to be bringing you episode 38 today. I bet it's just really amazing to me. And I just love that I get to do this and bring this to you guys every week. And I've been just so privileged to meet so many fascinating, powerful, fully embodied women who are just real and just doing it. And by it, I mean their thing, you know, and really unapologetic in that. And I admire that and I aspire to that. So I want to remind everyone to leave an iTunes review because if you leave an iTunes review, I will be donating to the organization Girl Rising. You can find more about them at girlrising.org. So every month I choose an organization to do a give and to promote awareness around. And so that's the one I'm choosing for the month of March. Without further ado, today on the show, we have Asim Batra, who is a TV show writer, and she's a showrunner and a creator, and she's an actress, and she's a mom, and she's an incredible woman. And I had the privilege of sitting down with her in her home, chatting with her, and her story is remarkable, which is so funny because when I asked her to be on the show, she said, oh, I don't know if I have anything that's interesting. (laughs) Like I was riveted. I could have talked to her for at least another hour. And I hope you guys enjoy my conversation with Asim. So speaking of when you were a child, where are you from? Well, I was born in Ohio, but wasn't there very long. And then my parents, my dad specifically, uh, moved us to a small town in Georgia, which, you know, from looking at me, you would just be like, of course, Southern girl. (laughs) So how old were you when you moved to Georgia? Uh, I was about three years old. Oh, little. Mm -hmm. Little and stayed there until I was about 12. And then where? And then out to Orange County, California. Oh, Mm -hmm. so the remainder of your formative years were California. Yes, yes. And did you become a California girl? Like, was it beach? Uh, No, I was uh, very much a theater person. (laughs) That's where I found my crowd was uh, sort of the misfits who, you know, hid away in the drama room. Yes. And were you an actor? Yes. Okay. That's what I wanted to do. Then. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So how did that evolve through high school? And then did you go to college and study theater? Or? I did. I um, It was one of those things where I didn't really know where to fit in in school and found my voice doing that, being other people. I think that was the most comfortable thing is like, oh, you can put on a costume and be anyone. And it felt so good. So that was my passion all through high school. Now. I was not encouraged very much to do that. My parents, who you know are immigrants from India, uh, were like, "What are you doing? We do did not come here for this." We so you're here. first generation. I'm first generation. So they just found it to be bizarre, like that. You know, they'd come all this way, and that's the opportunity you want—the one that's the most risky and not going to happen. You know, and I even I had a drama teacher who I got the lead in the musical sophomore year. And she's like, very happy for you. I just want you to know it'll probably never happen again. There just aren't parts written for someone like you. So it was like running against the wind, you know. And so I did I kind of had a fuck you attitude about it. But when I graduated high school, it all kind of became internalized. Like, of course, these people are right. This is so hard. So I tried my hardest to move away from it. I became a, became an 
economics major. No, and you I was did horrible at it. Like I don't even That's know. That's my worst nightmare. It, I still actually have recurring nightmares about <laughs> about the math. I'm rubbing my chest because I'm having yeah. anxiety. For it lasted you. all of a couple months before I said this is nuts, and then I became a communications theater double major, <laughs> which I loved communications. It was so interesting. Yes, and that's exactly theater. what I did. Oh, I went great. to BU. I went to Com, the communication school yeah. at BU, because my parents were also like my dad was basically said, "What makes you think you're so special?" Just so relate to everything you yeah. said. So, and where did you go to school? I went undergrad to UC San Diego, and then I did grad school. I had yet another, maybe I can fit myself into a box. I did grad school at USC for something called communication management. And what does that prepare you for, allegedly? Um, corporate America. <laughs> Well, that particular program, you can, it's very flexible. You can do many things. There's marketing, there's, you could go restructure corporations, or you can go into television, but it's usually like the business side more than anything. But what I did was use it as an opportunity to find the one person who had connections to Hollywood and just like glue myself to him and hope that it paid off. And it did. During that time, did you still have that seed of hope and like desire in you? Or, and so you were doing two things at once. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the weird part is I was fighting against every urge to not believing that I could actually really do something in this business in, in you know, TV or film. And yet also saying, well, there's a little voice saying, well, Maybe you can. And I think the reason I picked USC was simply it was out in Los Angeles. So it was like this subconscious just saying, just get near there, but not having the courage to necessarily say it out loud. But I was doing stand up after undergrad. So I knew it wasn't dead. That dream wasn't dead. I just never knew if I could really make a career of it. But then, you know, in my timid little way, I just wouldn't stop putting myself near the action. I don't think I had the courage that some people have to like come out and just start auditioning because of all the negative sort of like, you can't do this. You'll ruin your life. You'll end up on the street. You'll be working at McDonald's was a big one, um, which I'm like, there's no shame in that. Sure. I'll work at McDonald's and sing Broadway, you know, like what's the big deal. But uh, just kind of putting myself as close to the dream as I could put myself. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and and stand up is no joke. And I, I mean, I talked to Claudia about this and her mom, Joanne, both on the show about how hard that is and how and I, and I said this, I think, in my conversation with Claudia um, or no, with Joanne, that I did a lot of improv for years and years and years. But then I tried stand up. I did a stand up class. I didn't even make it through the whole series because I was so cocky, like, oh, I've done years of improv and sketch comedy. And blah, blah, blah. I tanked. I was horrible <laughs> at it. I was, I was like, why is no one laughing? I'm hilarious. <laughs> like, yeah. Crickets. It's tough. It's tough, and then the environment is really tough. Even more so. I didn't even make it to the stage. Yeah. I mean, Claudia said she had a drink thrown at her. Oh, on yeah. tour one time. I, I believe it. I mean, the other comedians are bad enough, yeah. but then forget the audience. <laughs> yeah. you know, it's yeah. just, it's cutthroat. Yeah. It gave me huge amounts of anxiety. I'm so glad I didn't know how hard it was going to be. I was very ignorant about stand-up. I said, well, I, I can do this. And yeah. so I did all right. I, you know, I'd have my moments where I'd bump, but a, a lot of times I do very well, uh, well enough that someone from the LA comedy store, I was down in San Diego, saw me and invited me up there. Now, that was a different story. I did not do well my first time up in the LA wow. Comedy Store. That's a, a big leap to jump into the comedy store up here in LA. That's very intimidating. It was. It was crazy. Yeah. <laughs> so then I did what any traumatized Indian daughter would do, and I said, I'll just go to grad school, <laughs> which was insane. That, that I put myself through that was insane. Wow. I mean, I guess it's great you learn how to think. You learn how to work in groups put up with all kinds of personalities. Well, prepared you to be a showrunner. Yeah, sure. very <laughs> much so. Sure. It was yeah. exactly the training you needed. I mean, weirdly, doing the management part of it. Yeah. It did. Yeah, because you, yeah. <laughs> so, okay, well, we'll circle back yeah. to that. So, okay, so you are doing stand-up. I mean, all of these things are contributing to your skill set in like what we just said, but in being able to 
craft a story and have all these characters and the way that you see things in a way that going to theater school doesn't. Right. You know what I mean? So. Yeah. I mean, part of me wished still wishes I had gone to film school or something like that. Um, because I never saw myself as a writer. I always saw myself as a performer. And so I had to teach myself story. I don't think it, I understood it. And I'm still teaching <laughs> myself and trying to learn. But what I did learn is, so I ended up working for this journalist out of grad school. Was this the person you're referring to? Yes. Okay. This guy was just kind of knew everybody. And so he was working on a super interesting case about this journalist, I mean, sorry, about this scientist who was accused of spying for the Chinese. Ooh. And it turned out to be an absolute snow job. It was not true. He was just, uh, he did some things in, under his clearance that were wrong, but the government built a case against him based on total fear and none of it was true. And it just kind of showed how the media can take a story and fabricate things. Right. Yeah. Like without fact checking. And it was so fascinating. And it was about storytelling, really. It's the story of this man. And there were so many little stories inside of that story. Mm. And so everything we do is a story. So yes. it just, when I thought about it, I'm like, well, journalism is one way to tell a story, but I, I'm still so interested in entertainment. And so I, from there, I decided to go off because one of the things happened while we're doing that is ABC wanted to buy the story. So I think it was John Ridley actually wrote a script for it. It never wow. got made, but he wrote a script for ABC. I love that story about you discovering that piece of, of storytelling in that. So from there, what was your next move? Headed over to ABC where because of this journalist, I knew um, I got to meet this woman, Susan Lyne, who had come out of journalism herself and was working as um, in the miniseries department and had been promoted to president of ABC. So she and I, she interviewed me, she and I had a great conversation and she allowed me to be her second assistant and go into meetings with her. And so I became one of those writers who actually, I know what happens on the executive level. And I don't realize how few people know that. Yeah. And it's super interesting now that I, I just took it for granted that everybody knows what all the executives do and they don't. They don't know that there's a current department and a development department. And so it was like interesting for me to know that yeah. and know what everyone's doing on the other side. Sure. So I did that for a while and then I said, okay, I need to demote myself. <laughs> so I asked her, can I work in the comedy department, you know, and take a demotion and yeah, I was working for the president, but it would give me time to work on scripts. And so I moved. Well, I'm just joking. It's not a demotion. But yeah. I, <laughs> I, I started reading everything I could and wrote a spec and uh, gave it to another person I met, an agent I met through this journalism program. So everything's kind of connected if you want it to be. Yeah, It's really who you meet and how you use your connections. I was going to grad school for something completely unrelated. But I always kept my ears open <laughs> to like who has a connection to what I want to do. When you were willing to risk asking for the demotion, I'm air quoting, and, and asking, you know, and submitting and writing something and submitting it. I mean, that's the funny part is like, it seems like a risk, but I found myself to be a huge coward because I'm like, well, let me do this within the confines of a stable job. You know, a lot of people <laughs> come here and they're like, I'm just going to write and figure out how to get in. And I was like, I'm going to have this stable job that pays something that allows me to live and then quietly write on the side. And I think that's the little Indian girl in me. It's like my parents were so afraid for me mm -hmm. that they put that fear in me. So that was my way of doing it. But it worked. It worked. It's maybe not how I. I would mean, do I don't. It. Is that cowardly or is that really smart? <laughs> I, don't, I think I don't. I would. I'm gonna tend to the latter. I feel like because it makes things go maybe slower. I don't know. It's hard to even tell. It's hard to look back and know. But it was the way I had to do it to feel okay. To feel like I wasn't disappointing anyone or worrying anyone. Yeah, I was just so worried about that stuff. I I put my anxiety out in the world for people to know, because I feel like a lot of people me suffer too. from that. Yes, me too. So I was not some bold, I'm going to make it in Hollywood. I was like, 
hey, I don't know, but I don't know how not to do this either yeah. because there's nothing else I want to do. Yeah. So, so what was the spec script? Okay. So my first spec script, which the agent was like, you can't write this as a spec, was a less than perfect, which Claudia <laughs> did work on. Okay. And she's like, this is a good spec script, but you've got to write a show people know. So then I wrote a Will and Grace and um, she really liked it. And then she was at UTA, got me into meet at UTA, and then I got signed off of that Will and Grace. That's incredible. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> It was very lucky. I mean, it was a few years after I started working as an assistant, which was, again, it was really So you were lucky. in your 20s? I was in my 20s. Wow. Yeah. Late 20s, though. <laughs> <laughs> Still, I mean, that's, that's remarkable. So you got signed. Mm -hmm. Then what was your next move? So I got signed pretty late into the season. So I, you know, you have to make your rounds doing just general meetings before you can even meet with showrunners. So by the time I did my general meetings, pretty much everyone was staffed up. It didn't happen for me that season. So I applied to the fellowship at Disney for writing. I didn't get in the first time. I got in the second time. And that really was a good fellowship because it allowed us to get, again, get paid while working on our specs. And that time something really interesting happened was we were all assigned to mentors. So they were executives there who were supposed to mentor people in the program. My mentor rejected me. She was like, oh, I don't really want to work with her because I kind of know her and she should just go off and work with someone she doesn't know. And it felt really personal and, and like an excuse. And I was shattered. And it was one of those moments where I was like humiliated and I didn't know what to do. But again, like if you want something bad enough. Some people call it the secret. I don't believe in that. I believe you just keep making these little moves you don't even know you're making. I remembered this guy I worked with was covering scrubs. So I wrote him this long email saying, look, I don't have a mentor. Will you be my mentor? I love scrubs. Maybe we can talk about that. And next thing you know, like he gets me a meeting. He likes my spec a lot. I wrote a Curb Your Enthusiasm. He gets me a meeting at not with Scrubs, but with Bill Lawrence for another show he's doing. And that during that meeting, I was like, do I tell Bill how much I love Scrubs right now? Or, or does he hate having his butt kissed like this? And because for me, it was genuine. It wasn't like, but I'm like, he must get sick of hearing this. But I'm like, forget it. I'm going to tell him. So I told him what it meant to me because, you know, my my dad's a doctor and my brother is a doctor. So just what that meant to me. And I turn around and, and in a week or so, that show goes away. Um, it was called Nobody's Watching. And I'm getting a call saying, well, you didn't get that job, but would you like to be on Scrubs? So it was like, hey, I'll tell you, I'm the luckiest person ever to get that first job. And what um, did that feel like when you got that call? Oh, my gosh. It was, it was truly like a dream coming true. I mean, it was, you know, you never think a little Indian girl who grew up in Georgia and didn't look like anybody else. And somehow I'd get from like Georgia to California and then be on a TV show that I absolutely loved. It was bizarre and exciting and like heady. It was the, it was like one of the greatest moments ever. That's so I awesome. remember everything about it, you know, where I was, what I was doing. So it was wow. exciting. Yeah. And how long did you work on the show? I was there from the fifth season to the season right before, I think it was season nine is when it changed to Scrubs Medical School. Right. Um, I remember that. Yeah. So I left right before that. The strike had happened. Oh, yes. And we moved from um, NBC to ABC. I think that's right. And ABC said, you have to, you have to fire half your staff because we're going to cut your budget. You know, you can be on because Disney owned us. Mm. So uh, they're like, we'll renew you, but you have to cut the staff. And Bill, who's a great guy, was like, well, I'm not going to fire half the staff. I'll hire half of you for the first half and half for the second. Mm. Yeah, That's he's a nice. great guy. And and uh, so I worked the first half and then I moved to an animated show. And what was the animated show? Uh, it was the Cleveland show. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> and how, what was that like? Uh, it was interesting. You know, that was a lot more like the stand-up world. It was a little more cutthroat people. It was very male because it's Seth uh, McFarlane. So that world is very male. Nice guys, funny guys, really funny guys, like guys out of stand-up who know their stuff. But you do feel like, 
oh my God, am I funny enough to sit here? And I was the only woman for a couple seasons. So oh, I was, was just going to say, you were the only woman? Wow. Yeah, for two seasons. I was there for three seasons and for two of those. Did you feel in the writer's room like you could get a word in? Or what was it like? Was there space made for you? or You definitely have to walk a tightrope because it's tricky. I- I'm not going to lie and say it's not tricky. Yeah, As much as I love that experience, many things about that experience, it was also alienating in many ways because yeah. it just felt like moments of, you know, do I get to talk here or am, am I going to be har- more harshly judged for everything I say? Yeah. And you are. So you you have to be careful and you have to be careful about like they can all cut up with each other and insult each other. You can't do that. I remember once I, I did that. And my boss was kind of like gave me stink eye. <laughs> and wow. so I said to him, like, I know if so-and-so had made that joke, you would have been fine with it. Yeah. You know, and he's like, no, no, it's fine. But I knew I would cross start like crossed a line. Yes. There. So it's it's uh it's a little bit like holding your breath, which isn't always a fun way to work. Right. So it wasn't for me long term, but I loved so much about the experience. I yeah. loved doing animation. I loved they let me do some of the voices. So I had a great time there. That's fun. And what was next for you after that? Did you met your husband in here somewhere? Yes. My when husband that- I met way back in college at UC oh, you San Diego. Did. Yeah. Okay. So what was he? So, okay, yeah. wait a minute. Let's back up to that. That's <laughs> yeah. interesting. So you're college sweethearts. Yes. Did you stay together since then? We did. We had a long distance relationship while I was in grad school okay. at, UC- at USC and he was at UC San Diego. Mm-hmm. Um which was fine because we were like trying to do our own thing. But he was there for the whole ride and he saw the stress and like the craziness of yeah. it. Um, we eventually, he moved out here and we eventually got engaged and we were engaged forever for like four years. Well, you're both busy. What <laughs> yeah, does he busy do for a living? Like, he's a software engineer. Yeah. So it was really just like I had just gotten scrubs and I didn't know what to do and how to be, be a writer really. I was like thrown in there. Yeah. So I'm like, I'm not planning a wedding on top of this. Yeah. So we waited and got married during the Cleveland show, which was fun because got to invite the whole staff. And oh, that's do fun. That. Yeah. And did you do a traditional Indian? We wedding? did. Yeah. My husband's family, they're all from the Bay Area and they're kind of like crunchy hippie. So they weren't like super traditional. We were going to do both. And they said, ah, we've seen the other kind. Just do an Indian wedding. Great. So Let's save a little time and money. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So we did that. And he rode in on a horse. And oh, <laughs> where did funny. you get married? Uh, in Orange County. Oh, yeah. beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> wow. And you have a big family. Was it a big wedding? Um, a lot of my family came out from India. So oh, that was wow. special. Yeah. That's wonderful. It was cool. Yeah. I'm sure the Orange County people were like, oh, this is interesting. A horse coming down our street <laughs> and like Indian drums. That was probably kind of off putting for them. But, ha ha ha. <laughs> because Orange County is so conservative. <laughs> it is. Yeah. It is conservative. I mean, it was in a weird way another version of Georgia. <laughs> Interesting. So, yeah, but it's changing there a lot now. Is it? Mm-hmm. I haven't. I don't spend that much time down there, but it's Probably. beautiful. Yeah, it is beautiful. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. I'm used to our LA peeps. That, uh-huh. Like you say, white horse and Indian drums, and they're like, yeah, I just did that last week. Yeah, like, yeah. that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um. So wow. And then where was it that you became a mom or decided? Did you always know you wanted to be a mom? Yes, I I knew I wanted to be a mom. Um, it was during the Cleveland show. And I was already like hormonal. You know, they tell you it's going to happen. And you're like, not to me. And And then then you just want to cry. And I pictured myself like nine months pregnant going into labor in that room of all men. And I said, oh, fuck this. (laughs) And I walked into my (laughs) boss and I said, I love you guys, but I can't do it here. Because I just pictured that. I mean, I really, I couldn't take it. I couldn't take the stress of like, just that environment, being pregnant. It's like such a vulnerable position. And to be the only woman in that room, I couldn't do it. I needed to find some girls yes. <laughs> who could be like, all right, we get it. You know, things yes. happen to your body. So I uh, took some time off to have my baby right after the Cleveland show. And you have a boy? I have a boy. And how old is he now? He's seven. Oh, 
They're, it's so yummy. Mine's nine and a half. And yeah. they're, they're just Tell so me they cuddly. still hug you at that age. Oh, oh kisses good. me on the mouth at the bus stop. Right. Okay. That's all I want. I don't want that to go away for a while. Until it's weird for them, then okay, fine. I think but- it'll go, My here's my hope. <laughs> it'll go away f- during his high school years yeah. and then it'll come back. Yeah. I'm, that's what I'm hoping. <laughs> Boys are the best. I, I mean, know. sometimes I look at my friends who have girls that they sit in color. Oh, I know. <laughs> and I'm like, what is that? Like? I mean, it's constant motion, constant mom. Yeah. You know, and I, there's just no, when he's home and I'm home, there's no, there's no break. There's no like, I'll send an email. There's none of that. No, I know. Mine, mine likes jumping on me and I'm always going, ow, stop, you know, and <laughs> he really needs to wrestle. That's just yes. his thing. And I forget, and I I look at him like, what's wrong with you? I'm like, oh, nothing's wrong with him. He's a, He's boy. a boy. He needs this. He ne- they need it. Yeah, but he doesn't have a sibling, so it's me. Same. You know? Yeah. Same. Mine's <laughs> yeah. an only two. Yeah. And does he wrestle with his dad? He does, yes. And his dad isn't going out. So <laughs> yes. He's yes. more used to but it. For now, until for he gets now. bigger. Oh, until he hits. If he hits something he's not supposed to, then he exactly. goes out. Yeah. Exactly, which always happens. Yes. So you had your son. Yeah. You were on... What show were you on when you got when you were? I know you just said this, but I'm losing. Oh, my when I was pregnant. Yeah, um, I started. Uh, I I got pregnant on the. And it makes it sound like someone in the room got me pregnant. <laughs> I was. I conceived while <laughs> while on the Cleveland show, and I I went onto a friend's show. Um, his show is called Bent, and it, I was just there for pre production. And then I got so big, I told him, "I think I'm having this baby. I was due three days ago. I'm yeah. gonna, I'm going to be done now." <laughs> yeah. You know, went in and expected to have my little moment, my Pampers commercial where baby comes out and mommy and baby are snuggling and the photographer takes newborn pictures and happily ever after. And it, it wasn't that from even the moment I stepped into the delivery room. It was a full, <laughs> unadulterated nightmare. Oh, no. What happened? Yeah. Nothing I expected ha- came true, which is something I don't think women get to talk about, like this birth plan you have for yourself, throw it out the window. What was your birth plan? Had you written out? Like someone told me to do that. I did. Someone made me do that too. And I wanted an epidural, but I wanted to try and just have, I didn't want a C-section. I wanted to try and have a natural delivery in that way. I guess I can say vaginal delivery. Oh, you can say anything you want. (laughs) Yes. And um, you can curse. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) And uh, I was a week late and the doctor decided I should be induced, which was already panicking me. I'm sure. I think she saw that I'm small and maybe this baby's not going to come out. And I was like, well, can't I just wait one more week? What could really happen? She goes, well, your baby could die. So in the face Jesus. of that, I'm like, well, <laughs> fine. Jeez, I get it. <laughs> yeah. So I packed a bag, went to the hospital, got induced. That really did nothing. I went into full labor. But the baby, I was not dilating. It was not coming out. So they gave me another epidural, and that's when the hell started. The epidural went up instead of down. Oh, it went down as well, but it's called a high block epidural. So I went numb from like my eyeballs down. Oh couldn't, God! Couldn't really, and it it makes you feel like you can't breathe. Oh, you can't swallow. Honey, that sounds horrific. Yeah, and so it was like a nightmare. And I'm telling them I can't breathe, I can't swallow, and they're like snapping at me. Well, your vitals are fine, so just relax. And there, and that's my first time I realized there's not a lot of support for women having babies in this country because we are told basically like be quiet, do your thing. And I never thought let me get a doula or anything because I didn't think I was going to need it. And when you're having your first baby, you're not always financially secure enough to hire people. Now I'd be like, whatever, I'm hiring everyone because we have no village anymore, right? You know, there's no support. And so (laughs) I would have just gone into debt if I knew then what I know now. You know, my baby was fine. It was great. But instead of that moment of baby putting, you know, gets put on your chest and you cuddle, I was clutching my husband's hand in terror because I thought I was going to die. They hand the baby to him finally when I let go of Alex and let him go. And I didn't get to have that moment with my son. And then they start giving me medicine to undo the epidural. And I go pretty much blind and start vomiting for 12 hours. Can't see the baby. So it was just one of those things that made me realize. And and nobody did anything, really. It was just like, well, it happened. I couldn't speak to the anesthesiologist. It was just a nightmare. 
And it made me really aware of that we're not, we're not getting this birthing thing right and just reading about it, knowing that we have a very high rate of maternal death in this country for a developed nation. It's scary. Um, and then unfortunately after that, Cooper was good for two weeks, but then he developed such bad reflux that he had a feeding disorder, which lasted, you know, pretty much four years of his life. So it was like, that's why I have one. <laughs> and just how you see kind of like how it's not what what they paint, that it's just gonna be a smooth thing and anything can happen. And there's very little support. So my experience with motherhood was very different than a lot of people. And I was also trying to work at the same time. So I, I got a deal at Universal very soon after. I wrote, I wrote a pilot about two weeks after Cooper was born. I went back and wrote a pilot. <laughs> was that, well, I have so many questions. Yeah. First of all, thank you for sharing that yeah. story. That yeah. is very personal and very emotional. And I'm sorry that you didn't get the emotional support that you so deserved. Thank you. Well, I mean, I, I share it because it's like that when you bring up motherhood and having a child for me, that's what it, how it started. So, uh, you know. Yeah. No, it's important. It's important because there's some woman that's going to listen to this that went through that that's going to feel less alone. Yeah. Did you have any postpartum? I mean, I'm, I'm sh obviously you had post-traumatic stress. Yeah. Did you also have postpartum? Did you? I don't know if it was ever diagnosed postpartum, but I was seeing a therapist. And it, it was interesting because for me, I was almost okay while I was breastfeeding. And then when that stopped, the hormones change. And I really, I went kind of crazy because my kid was still not well. And they were talking like putting in a feeding tube. So I really needed to be with a therapist who worked with families who had kids who had been in the NICU. And so she was able to like talk me through what was happening. So there was like definite depression there um, and trauma there. Yeah, of course. <laughs> so imagine I'm like sitting there trying to tell jokes in the room while all of this is That's, going on. Yeah. It's impossible. I wish I had been on a drama at that point. I would have been better. Yes, than, totally. Yeah. So was writing this pilot that you wrote, was it sort of therapeutic for you? I don't know if it was therapeutic, but what was cool about it was I was so out of my head. And, and, and I knew this pilot because I had done most of the work, mental work for it before I had my son. So I was prepared to put it on paper, put it in script form. It was, you know, the story beats were all there. So that's lucky because I don't know if I could have gotten my head together enough to come up with that part. That's always the hardest part. But I was so like, I don't have time to be critical of myself right now that I think I wrote a really good script. Because that's part of my problem in life is silencing the voice that says, you suck, you know, and you can't do this. And when that voice is silenced, my work is better. Mm -hmm. And so I think at that point, I was so overwhelmed and like so needing to get back to my baby that I was able to just write what I thought was good and funny and not worry too much. And it was like something I'm proud of, um, which did get shot, not that season, another season. Okay. Uh, which is another story, but okay. a good time for me to, to write that particular yeah. piece. Therapeutic, I don't know. That experience, the whole experience of having my son and going to therapy made me understand so much about myself. Because, you know, you have to kind of get out of your head and realize who you are and fix who you are to be a better mom. Yes. So. Yeah. I always say motherhood literally ripped me open. Mm -hmm. Like I just, it just ripped me apart and ripped me open and I was reborn, not in a Christian science sort of way, yeah. but just like. It does happen. I, and I didn't have a choice. You yeah. know, it was either to kind of shrink and dissolve or just step into this. Be and, and I had to, because I had to be there for my son. So I can, I can relate to that. Yeah. Um, Wow, what a journey. <laughs> yeah. My gosh. And so, and all along this time, you're dealing with this feeding mm -hmm. disorder. Yes. And what ultimately was the help that your son got that alleviated that? You know, it was a tough problem because what happens is the babies are in pain. Certain babies feel a lot of pain when they reflux and, and, uh, because they have a lot of acid. 
And that doesn't become the hardest part. The hardest part was A, getting a doctor to believe me, but B, um, he developed a feeding disorder because he attached fear to feeding. And so it, some kids get it so badly that if they hear a jar of baby food being opened, they'll throw up. That's how bad it can be. So for him, it was just kind of like stepping back and letting someone else feed him, letting the nanny feed him, because my husband and I were so stressed out. But I think on top of all his physical discomfort, he could feel our stress. So we had to let someone else who didn't have emotions tied to it do it. And then it was just a slow process of like getting the right feeding therapist, getting the right reflux medication, and letting him grow up and like things you don't even think are related, like putting your hands in wet sand. Babies with feeding disorders won't touch food. So they become sensory, like they become denied that sensory experience and and hate even touching stuff. So it was a lot of that stuff, a lot of, you know, physical therapy, OT, (laughs) just, (laughs) you know, and then time. It takes time and patience and taking your own emotions out of it and letting the kid like, He's going to eat three bites today, but let him control it. And nobody knows anything about this, really. If you go to a pediatrician, half of them don't know what you're talking about. I've never heard of it. Yeah, it's it's fairly rare. But I've actually met a lot of people who've gone through this. It especially happens to children who have like heart troubles and they can't eat. And then they are on a tube and then they aren't used to eating. Sure. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. Makes perfect sense. Yeah. So he's seven now? He's seven How is and he now? great. Like he'll eat anything. So oh. he's good. It just took us a long time. And you were just, de- you were gentle and patient. And and the way that you just described that was just, that's so loving to be open. But it's the hardest thing as a parent. To, oh, like, yeah. And I wasn't always, pay- I mean, there were probably times where I had to like go upstairs and just throw myself on the bed and like remove myself. I, I mean, I was going batshit. Let's. Seeing a child like not gain weight and lose weight and, you know, you see them, you're like, how are you still alive right now? And our decision not to put him on a tube because of the tube makes it worse. Um, You know, I'm only bringing this up if anybody goes through it. Absolutely. No, thank you. I love, I think the more we talk about all this stuff, it just is so helpful because people don't want to ask, people don't want to talk about it, you know, so. Well, everybody wants to have that perfect family right especially in the age of social media it's like look how happy we are look how uh, great we all get along and truthfully a lot of us go through absolute hell oh yeah (laughs) starting our family yes i think and i think that doesn't really exist you know there's a lot of talk about that yeah but it's not really real i mean it might be one moment in captured in a photograph right. but it certainly isn't like that all the time and yeah. i think it's good to pull the covers on that yeah. for all of us just all of us humans all of us moms to feel like okay she looks great in that moment you know but she's just as crazed as i am yeah. trying to pack lunch and get to school on time and all the things you totally. know so wow okay so you got through that phase of him being uh having this disorder is mm-hmm. it called the disorder mm-hmm. and he's healthier now so did mm-hmm. you feel like you could breathe a little more yes. easily when he was four and a half and five and- yes it started getting easier i started like uh, the anxiety started lifting i mean i'm forever changed by the experience sure. but i felt like i'm a i'm a comedy writer again i can be funny again and yeah. laugh and i don't feel like the weight of the world is on me so it happened all at the right time um, for me to, you know, develop a show and get something on the air. I was like ready as opposed to if it had happened right. while I was going through all that. Yeah. So what what did you write um, at that time? Well, it happened at the perfect time because it was called I Feel Bad. <laughs> and it's a book of uh, sketches and captions by this author, Orly Oslander. And she writes about all the things about motherhood and parenthood that make you feel terrible that we don't want to say out loud because we're all trying to say, hey, we're good. We're perfect. Look how cute we are. You yes. know, here's yes. us in our matching denim or yes. whatever it is. <laughs> um, so <laughs> that really resonated. And so a- Amy Poehler had the book and also Julianne Robinson, who's a director who they both had the book and wanted to develop it. So they were doing it together. 
And I couldn't have been more lucky to be asked to be a part of it because it's like these amazing women. So it was this team of women who are also moms. And we just related on every level. And we're like, yeah, let's let's do this. <laughs> That's so great. Yeah, it was really fun. That must have been really empowering to be on that team and developing that. And- Absolutely. I mean, it was incredible. You're never too old to learn things. And watching Amy, I mean, she was the piece of me that was missing. She was the confident. This is what a confident woman who's told from childhood that they are fine and can do whatever looks like. And to even see her at this advanced age, I still was able to learn so much from sure. her. And like, you can own it, you know? Like, she, So what was interesting was, I feel bad, just the title lends itself to like, sort of like a downer feel, but she spun everything into, oh yeah, but I don't really give a shit, you know? <laughs> like, so the I feel bad almost became like, I feel bad I don't spend enough time with my kids, but also don't give a shit because I really need to go take a nap right now. now. Yes. And it's empowering to say, I have needs too. Yes. Oh, my God. Preach. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh because, my God. you know, moms are not really allowed to say that. We do not have Mother's Day cards saying, Mom, thank you for taking time for yourself. Yes. They're all like, Mom, thank you for your martyrdom and sacrifice. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, so we're expected to be those figures, and then you lose part of yourself. Yes, you know so exactly. Having her being able to do the tongue and cheek version of that in my ear, I'm like, yes, this is what I want to do. I it's love like that. The unapologetic. Some of this is bullshit. <laughs> you know, statement of I feel bad. Yeah. And so the show got picked up. The show got picked up. It was really fun to make. Um, We don't know if we'll get another season, but I'll tell you, when you do something that you had a great time doing, like it's hard to let go, but it's also like, hey, we did something we loved and had a great time with. So whatever happens, I'm more at peace with it than if I'd been like, give me another crack. I know I can make it better, you know? Right, right. And you have this evidence with this team of women of of producing something so amazing. So, you know, you could do it again. I hope so. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. Wow. That's exciting. And so was that the first time you met Claudia when you hired her? No, I met Claudia. We were on Sean Saves the World, which okay. was a Sean Hayes show run by Victor Fresco. And Claudia opened my world because she's such a kick-ass female. And I loved her attitude, which I didn't realize I could have of like looking at some of the boys who would pull some of the bullshit and be like, well, that's bullshit, you know? Yes. yes. And I'm like, oh, you can do that? Yeah. (laughs) And also the idea that women aren't funny had been instilled in my brain, you know, from my early career in comedy, starting with stand up. Um, And Claudia was absolute evidence that women are extremely funny. She was the funniest in the room. And so I always tried to go back to Claudia for anything I needed. I'd call her up and be like, hey, can you help me with this and punch up that? So when this show happened, there was no one I wanted by my side more than her. And she's she was great. That's so awesome. Yeah. Oh, I love that. That's so <laughs> exciting. I just love it. Well, she's just that out and out feminist. She, you get it when you see her because uh, she just has the right take on everything. She explains things to you about like, well, do you realize part of why this is happening is because we just don't get those opportunities. And it's like stuff I haven't allowed myself to say out loud because people tell you it's complaining or it's But she's like, no, fuck it. This is true. It's the truth. It's fact. Just look. Yeah, it's true. (laughs) And so allowing myself to be able to say, oh, that's true. Um, And not feeling like, oh, well, I better shut up about it or the boys won't like me, you know, because that's a lot of what we've done at the beginning of our careers is like, the boys have to like you or you're kicked out, you know? And I don't mean like you in a physical way. I mean, accept you. Think that you're cool and funny and like um, capable of being one of the boys. Yeah. And I don't think Claudia gives a shit. Yeah. So I don't know how she's managed that, but, yeah. you know, it's amazing to watch. Yeah. 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 Well, she tells this story on the podcast about how when she was 15, she wrote a song called Fuck the World. <laughs> and that's how she got her first agent when she played it at her parents' house. And the agent was there and said, why don't you? And I'm like, that is so you. Like, yeah. Of course, you would write a song exactly. called Fuck the World, sing it, yeah. and get signed, and yeah. then book your first TV series. Like, yeah. 
And I admire that too, because I don't have, I was kind of raised to be polite and pleasing and, you know, don't overstep. And, you know, I've always admired women that are like that and are able to speak the truth with no fear of being labeled a bitch or, you know, because the fact is we're going to be no matter what we do. Yeah. Exactly. It doesn't matter. Yeah. So, wow. Cool. So have you, do you feel like you've seen a change since you started in Hollywood? Do you feel like you've seen a change for women? I I really do. I mean, it's pretty amazing actually, because when I started, I feel like there's maybe like one or two of us in a room. And I think that's changing. I think like the mix of the rooms changing um, in terms of other types of diversity, but it it is, it's like, it's changing. We have to be careful not to be like, okay, we're fine now. We don't have to do any more work. Yeah. Because I see a little bit of that going on. Right. But, um, and look, it's still hard. I hear all kinds of things still where people complain about us all the time. Like, well, they're taking all the jobs, <laughs> you know, women and minorities. I can't get a job now. And oh, gosh. people say that to my face all the time. Like, wow. Guys, really? That's yeah. bold. Yeah. It's so <laughs> weird. I'm like, well, who do you think you're talking to yeah. right now? But it's, it's an odd situation. Um, but, because they think of you as one of the boys. I'm air quoting, but it's like, there's this I don't know. I'm I don't guessing. Know. Yeah. yeah. I've been told so many weirdly insulting things. One person who's like a friend of mine, he's like, oh, you're, you'll always be fine because you're a woman and a, a minority. You'll work forever. And, and it just like robs you of all the hard work you've put in. And it's basically that idea of like, well, you'll always have a handout, which is such incredible bullshit. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. like I, I want to scream when people say things like that because it's just a lie. And it discredits your writing talent. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, it's just it's the so, biggest yeah. slam. <laughs> but it, And probably an unintentional one. Absolutely. Like you're saying, it's but just, it's just an ignorance. It's ignorance. Um, so it's still out there, certain mentalities. But boy, yeah, it has changed. Yeah. I can't say it hasn't. It yeah. is. And I feel weirdly old because I see, like, I'll give you an example. Like, oh, well, I, I guess I shouldn't give someone else's example. But the stuff that young women won't put up with anymore is so interesting yes. to me. Like the stuff I put up with. Oh, yeah. Compared to, they're like, well, I'm going to quit. I don't need to be around that kind of man. I'm like, well, no, you don't quit. You silently suffer and then somehow <laughs> drive him out or elevate yourself. That's what we all did. How are you not doing that? <laughs> like, but they won't even put up with it, even it's if that true. means they leave, you know? Yes. And Claudia and I talked about that and we were like, no, you get yours, but you, you yeah. know, suffer and in, in, in through yes. that. I mean, because we a lot of times you don't have a choice. Right. So right. <laughs> it has changed. The mentality has changed. Right. Because those girls, those millennial girls, women, those millennial women probably have less fear of if I lose this job, I'm never going to get another exactly. one. Exactly. They think, well, exactly. I'll just get another job. Absolutely. And uh, we had that fear of like, oh, I'll, I'll never work here again. Because that in was, Hollywood, totally, and <laughs> yeah. that was retaliation. It did happen if yes. you said anything or did something. All of a sudden, your reputation was well. She's difficult. You're blackballed. She's, she's yeah. a bitch. She's a bitch. She's awful yeah. to work with. She's not fun. Yeah. whatever it is, yeah. it's out there in a second. Yeah. So you grin and yeah. you bear it. Yeah. But no more, I think. Yeah. Which is nice. That's cool. <laughs> it is cool. I'm learning a lot from those millennials. <laughs> so, what is on the horizon for you at this moment i know you're waiting Boy, to hear I don't about know. i I'm feel just bad waiting for somebody to call my phone <laughs> oh, it's Southern been girl. real quiet <laughs> yeah i mean uh you know no one's banging down my door or anything so i'm just kind of in a holding pattern waiting to see what the next thing is if it um made a difference to run a show or not and we'll see yeah. um but i'm still at universal so we'll be doing something for them uh, in the coming season. So we'll see if it gets picked up or not. But right now it's just in that that creative phase of like reading things, meeting with people, trying to get ideas because I sometimes feel like I'm out of my own, <laughs> you know, original ideas. Yeah. Um, so you look for inspiration. Do you read a lot of books for that? Well, I try, but it, it's getting easier now, but I swear I feel like I didn't read for three years while my kid was little. Oh, absolutely. I was like... I didn't read a book of... I didn't read any fiction. I only read books on parenting or sleep training yeah. <laughs> for the first three or four years. Yeah. I think I read my first 
like contemporary fiction book, which I love. I, I'm just a voracious reader. When he was five, I swear to God, I was like deprived of it. Right. So I yeah, understand. Well, if anybody has good suggestions for me, I'm finally at a place where I can do that oh, again. Good. But yeah, I think I read the first five pages out of like 20 parenting books. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. There's got to be an answer in here for yeah. my pain. Yeah. And I read a lot of those books too, yes. like feeding books. Oh so. God, I bet. I bet. Yeah. Mine was the sleep books. I read all the sleep books. And the, I look back and he was sleeping fine. I was <laughs> You're just, like, just... He's a kid. That's what they do. Yeah. I just wanted to feel better yeah. myself and I couldn't. And I had postpartum and I was diagnosed later when he was two. I was finally diagnosed. And anyway, but it's just so hard. It's just <laughs> so hard. It is. Yeah. I mean, you don't realize how much you need that village that isn't there anymore yeah. until it happens. Yeah. And, you know, it's... It's really true. I mean, my friend, um, one of my really close friends, her sister just had a baby and she flew up to San Francisco to help. And it's her sister's first baby. And she said, gosh, you know, I haven't been around a baby in so long and I forget. And she said, I feel like I want to open like a postpartum retreat center where new parents can come as a couple or if they're single or whatever, you know, and get the support they need, get the, get all the things, you know, but the thing is like that take, that would take money. I know that's the problem. Like it, nothing makes you realize that the world is set up for men, <laughs> like having a baby. Yes. Um, there's no support. I mean, we're expected to bring up this next generation of humans, but people are like, screw you, just do it. And yet <laughs> we're living in a world where it's harder and harder to make a living on one income. So women are working and women also have the right to choose to work and have a career without it being like having a baby tanks that. But the structure of where, you know, our society does not take into account helping that out at all. And I think if we don't say it out loud, nothing's ever going to be done about it. And I think it has to. I mean, how do you expect that half your workforce, you know, has to do both these things with zero amounts of help. And yes, if you have money, it's easy. Right, you but can, that's such a small amount of our population. Of and even if you have money, the other kinds of support are not not there. You know, you can buy as much help as you need, but you still go home with that baby alone. Um, I don't know. I don't know what to do to change it. You kind of feel helpless. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, I... it not to get political, I never do, but I was on, um, or I, I should say I never do on the show. I do get political. I just don't get political on the show very much, a little bit. Um, but I was at breakfast yesterday, killing time. And there were these two women there from Denmark and we struck up a conversation. I mean, I'll talk with anyone anywhere. I'm very chatty mm -hmm. <laughs> as you can tell. And they were just this lovely, this mom and her teenage daughter. And we talked and talked and talked and they're from Denmark visiting and they were telling me all about Denmark and how they love it there and how beautiful it is. And they said, well, you know, you get a year paid leave when you have a baby. Yeah, that's amazing. Every single mother who's a citizen and you get a nurse that comes home with you. Every single mother in the country. Wow. I mean, they're doing it somehow. Yeah, I think it's just a mindset that has to be changed of like that the only value there is in life is money you know like if you can see the value of like raising up a generation of happy healthy children yes and the payout of that and is exponential that. yeah yeah um but i don't again that's why i say i like i don't know how you make people see I don't that either but it's something i think about a lot yeah me too <laughs> especially when when you have a kid and see what it takes then you go oh man we need to do better than this yeah this is not cool what's yeah. happening. Well, in your you know? story, your birth story, also as, as a huge piece of that, of, you know, that, that breaks my heart. And I mean, I was lucky. Nothing happened to me. I suffered for a while, but I think of all the women who go in and, and have something going on, like preeclampsia or something that's very dangerous and there's not support for them. And women of color, especially, are you know, um, at higher risk. So it's, I don't know, again, it's like, we got to do something about it because we're good. We should figure out these things. I know. You know? Like, I know. I think I'm, I'm formulating like a, a MILF podcast because I now have met all these amazing women. Like maybe there's something we can 
figure out. I don't know. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna marinate on it. Marinate I'm gonna come up with it. something. Yeah. <laughs> so um so what's gonna happen now is I'm gonna ask you three questions okay. that I ask every guest and then we'll go into the lightning round. Okay. So what do you think about when you hear the word MILF? <laughs> when I hear the word MILF, uh I think, gosh, have I gotten to that age yet? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> totally. And yes. <laughs> I know. It's it's and it's a scary. good thing. It's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. It's a good thing. You look good, girl. <laughs> What's something you've changed your mind about recently? I have to think about that. Yeah, we'll come back okay. to it. How do you define success? I think success, true success, is something that happens within you. And it's like you may not accomplish the thing you set out to do but have you been able to change what you want in a way that you know I, I set out to be an actor and it didn't quite work so I said let me be a writer and sometimes I miss that dream but it's like was I flexible enough to figure out a new dream a new thing to find some fulfillment and happiness and so I think it's like being flexible enough to change that life doesn't always work out but can you still figure out a way to find some happiness and fulfillment and really i wish more people just think of success as like an inner happiness and the fixing of yourself because we don't realize how broken some of us are from just like what we go through in our lives you you spend most of your life trying to put that back together and you don't even realize that's what you're doing so success to me is like can you Put yourself back together and start fresh as an adult, you know, start fresh as a whole person. Good answer. Wow. Uh, okay. Do you want to come back to what's something you've changed your mind what about recently? Is something I've, that's a hard one. I, I know. don't know. That's okay. And if there's no, yeah. maybe, maybe you haven't. You're maybe you're very decisive. That's <laughs> yeah. okay too. Okay. Lightning round of questions. Okay. Ocean or desert? Ocean. Favorite junk food? Pizza. Yeah. What kind? Uh, pepperoni. <laughs> Movies or Broadway show? Mm, Broadway show. Daytime sex or nighttime sex? Nighttime. Texting or talking? Talking. Cat person or dog person? Hmm. I like them both, actually, but I'd say slightly more dog person. Have you ever worn a unitard? <laughs> yes. Shower or bathtub? Uh, bathtub. Ice cream or chocolate? Ice cream. On a scale of one to ten, how good are you at ping pong? Uh, two. <laughs> <laughs> What's your biggest pet peeve? Um, inconsiderate people. Mm. If you could push a button and it would make everyone in the world 7% happier, but it would also place a worldwide ban on all hairstyling products, would you push it? Absolutely. <laughs> Superpower choice, invisibility, ability to fly, or super strength? Invisibility. Would you rather have a penis where your tailbone is <laughs> or a third eye? I'm going to go with the third eye. There's enough penises. <laughs> We're good. We're good on penises. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> what was the name of your first pet? Um, Bonnie. What was the name of the street you grew up on? Uh, you're not going to like this because it's not a good porn name. It was uh, Route 7 because <laughs> I grew up on a dirt road in Georgia. Well, let's make it Bonnie 7. Okay. I think that's, that's good. good. Yeah. Bonnie, Bonnie 7. seven. <laughs> she sounds like she's in a Western and yeah. she's going to like do a draw <laughs> exactly. on the street at high noon. Yes. All right. That works. <laughs> Asim, you're such a treasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate this it. This was a delight. I'll try and think about uh, what I have changed my mind on and I'll text you. Yeah, <laughs> okay. get back to me. <laughs> All I'll right. include it. Okay. Take care. Thanks so much for listening, guys. You can always find show notes on the website, milfpodcast.com and other goodies and blog posts and such. It's such a pleasure to bring this show to you guys every week. And I can't wait to bring you another exciting guest next week. Thanks so much for listening. Thanks.